Sean has it. Ryan. <laughs> song we're about to sing is a very old song um, and it's about the world worshiping the Lord and what a glorious sound that is when all God's children sing hallelujah he reigns and obviously there's not a lot of us here this morning so this song I think is perfect because Red Hill not only is Red Hill all worshiping the Lord all around the world today but what a glorious sound when all nations, all tribes, all tongues praise the Lord. So let's join in. i 
the storm surrounding me let it break at your name still call the sea to still the rage in me to still every wave at your name jesus jesus you make the darkness tremble
silence fear Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus In terms of that scripture I used in Ephesians about the church getting to know God and uh, then Paul praying for a gift of revelation and that they'd see differently, I believe that this is true for our finances as well. We've heard a lot in the church about the tithe, we've, we've listened to different scriptures in that, um, but I think there's something more even to this. Um, about nine years ago, we, we didn't have this building, we were in another building at the time, and somebody was up. Uh, doing the tithes and offering, and I, I didn't hear them speak, to be honest, but I felt God speak to me about the things for me in terms of, of tithes, offerings, finances. And if you look at uh, John 10, it says there that we're able to hear his voice, the shepherd. He's a good shepherd. And that goes across the board, so it goes in terms of our finances as well. And so I encourage you... Um, in the days ahead, in the weeks, and the years ahead, let God speak to you uh, because you're getting to know his voice, to recognize his voice. Let him speak to you about your finances. So, Lord, just thank you for everything you teach us uh, in, in all walks of our life, Father, in, in marriages, in having children, in what, we, what work we do, and here, too, in our finances, Lord, that you're a personal God, we follow your word in terms of what you say with finances, but you also speak to us in terms of our situations and circumstances. So, Father, bring your light into this uh, that we may see differently in tithes and offerings. So you can bring up your tithes and offerings, and we do do online. Um, Kathy Feldman. Presence is all I am longing for here in the secret place. Your nearness is all I am waiting for here in the quiet place. Here in the sea. Presence is all I am longing for here in the secret place. Your nearness is all I am waiting for here in the quiet place. Here in the sea. My soul waits for you alone, like the watchmen wait for dawn. Here I finally found the place where we'll meet the Lord face to face. Your presence is all.
Thanks to Matt. Yeah. It's his Thank time. you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Yeah. The announcements for the week. Um, Monday nights, men pray at 7 o'clock here. Guys, you're welcome. Tuesday at 10 o'clock, the ladies pray here in the morning. You're also welcome if you're a lady. <laughs> and... Uh, Wednesdays, if you look on the, our website, we do have home groups and that. It's on the website. And uh, young adults, I believe. Levi, where are you? When do they meet? After church. After church. So that's the Sunday. Fantastic, yeah. And uh, also we have a special announcement for the 17th, but uh, an, a letter will go out, an email will go out about it. On the 17th at 6 o'clock, it's a Friday. We're going to have a time just of gathering together, having a, a meal, which is a Lebanese meal, because a whole bunch of us, as you know, went to Lebanon recently. So that's something really to look forward to. Deb will fill in the details maybe next week or sometime better than I'm doing right now. <laughs> Good. Uh, anything else, Deb, that I should announce? Or? Thank you. Yeah, so the 18th, so it's a, it's a busy weekend. Um, we've got, well, we're going to relax on Friday night. Um, Saturday, we're going to work in the garden. That's how it lands up being so beautiful. It's all of us doing our bits. You're welcome to come 10 till 2, I believe. Now, there's an email out about that. And then that Sunday, the 17th, will be Father's Day, right? So, 19th, I mean. Well, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah. So, we have a special guy. Come up, Chan. Precious man. And, uh, yeah. Yes. 
It's our privilege to have Chan speaking today. I've asked Sarah to pray for her dad, yeah. father and Lord, I thank you for the man that you've made my father to be. Thank you for who he is, all of the traits that make him who he is. But most of all, Lord, I thank you that um, you've shown him how to be with you, how to lead from your influence. And I just pray that he does that this morning, that even with little time to prepare, that, God, you would speak through him, and that we would have ears to listen. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. fishes, right, and Jesus and God, they multiply it and everybody gets fed and there's leftovers, right? Now I'm not going to steal Catholic fun here. However, however, what happened at that moment, John tells us in chapter 6 that they wanted to make Jesus king. This is very important. The people who were fed, saw the miracle, experienced the miracle, and they wanted to make Jesus king right at the moment. And Jesus said no. Oftentimes, opportunities come into our life that aren't of God. And the decisions we have to make are, are we going to walk in that opportunity, or are we going to follow the will of God? And the disciples, they weren't quite getting it at this time yet either. Because they were like with the crowd. They're like, Jesus, we have a crowd. <laughs> you know, make a church. You can be king. You can do what you wanted to do. And they're encouraging him to do that. And he's saying, No, depart. Go across the lake. I'm going to spend some time with the Father. And that's the scene. Here we go, verse 45 in Mark chapter 6. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida. While he dismissed the crowd, after leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. About the fourth watch of the night. So the fourth watch of the night is anywhere between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. So he's allowed them to buffet the storm for a while, right? Because he's been with the Father. He went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them. But 
when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they landed at Genesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout the whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched him were healed. So again, this great thing happens. People want to make Jesus the king, right? And sometimes after a great thing happening, especially spiritually and in the Lord, circumstances come, storms come into our life that buffet us, right? We have amazing moments with God. And then the next moment, boom, we hit a wall or something hits us. Circumstances arise, and they come against us after these amazing moments with God. I wish I could tell you, I wish I could stand up here and say that once we become a Christian, it's great. Everything is perfect. Everything's easy. That life doesn't happen to us. You know, in any negative way, it's amazing. But that's not the truth, is it? Just because we are Christians doesn't mean that we don't die of cancer. Doesn't mean that we don't have pain or suffering. Doesn't mean that things don't come against us. But what does it mean, being a Christian, I have three truths I want to kind of bring out of this scripture. And the first one is, you are never out of God's sight. Never are you out of God's sight. He's always looking at us. His eyes are always upon us. In John 16, 33, he says, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. In 2 Timothy 3.12, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Those are promises I don't claim. <laughs> the promises of God that I'm going to have trouble, that I'm going to be persecuted. I don't claim those promises. We, don't pl we claim the great promises. Yeah, he'll supply all my needs according to his riches and glory, right? Those are the promises that I want to claim, and those are truth as well. But this is the promise. You will have trouble. You will suffer persecution if you're endeavoring to do what I'm calling you to do. In verse 46, after leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. The question for me, and it's always been for me, is after amazing times, do I turn my face back to God, or do I begin to trust in my own weight and in my own strength and in me, myself? Or do I get time alone and go into my closet and say, Jesus, I give you all the glory. Thank you for what you've done. You know, I tend to kind of rest on that, relax in it, and say, I can do this. Rather than going to that solitary place and understanding where, where it comes from. It comes from being plugged into heaven. It comes from the Father being plugged into him. It comes from those moments, even after victory, where we can say, I fall on my knees and just say, thank you, Lord, it's all about you. It's not about me. And that's what Jesus is sharing here. That's what he's revealing here. It's not about us. It's about 
Him. It's about Him working through us, doing these things through us. It's about Jesus coming, and because we're plugged into heaven, heaven comes through us. We become a channel of His greatness and His glory on this earth. And that only comes if we're plugged in if we're spending time with the Father, if we're hanging out with God as a, as a friend, as, as a son, as a servant, as a slave, as a soldier, we're all those things. And we're all those things at different moments and seasons in our life. And the question that I keep asking myself, Chan, will you take time to spend with the Father and do His work. Verse 47, Late that night the disciples were in the boat in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was alone on land. He saw that they were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against the wind and the waves. See, His eyes are always on us. He saw that they were in trouble. And they'd been in trouble a while. And that trouble is not taking God by surprise, right? <laughs> Oftentimes, we want God to take the pain away, the struggle away, right at the very beginning. But God wants us to learn something through it, right? God's not necessarily bringing the storm against them. That's the world, man. It's life. It's not God up there as a puppeteer saying, okay, I'm going to take you over here and it's going to hurt. No, life hurts. People make decisions to hurt us. We make decisions to hurt ourselves. What happens around us, circumstances that fly around us, you know, even, even our government makes decisions that hurt us. Who are we going to be in the midst of those things? That's what God feels like. That's what God wants to express to us. Who are you in the midst of the storm? Who am I in the midst of bad circumstances? And the Lord is aware of every one of our situations. You don't think he knows? You don't think God was surprised? You think God was surprised about COVID? <laughs> it didn't take God by surprise. God knows everything. He sees everything. He's omniscient. I mean, when Jesus walked on the water, right? It's a big lake. <laughs> it's a huge lake, right? And so he's walking on the water. He's not walking miles away from the boat. He's walking right to it. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He knows exactly where we are. He, he sees every moment of our life. Proverbs 15.3 says, The Lord is watching everywhere. Keeping his eye on both the evil and the good. And this is echoed in 2 Chronicles 16.9. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. He wants to strengthen us if we're committed to him, even in the midst of the storm. And in Hebrews 4.13, he says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. He sees everything. That's both a comfort and when we're struggling and when we're not doing the right thing, it's also like, okay, God does see me. Jesus didn't abandon his disciples in the storm, even though, you know, 
they were trying to derail the process of God in Jesus' life. No, he loved them. He was watching over them. He was with them. And the amazing thing about the disciples are, we don't know, the scripture doesn't tell us, but I think it was a while that they were rowing across. They weren't turning back. Can you imagine the discussion in the boat? Guys, this storm's too much. We should just turn back and go back to the shore. No, no, guys, this is the will of God. We've got to keep pressing forward. <laughs> Those are real discussions that we have in life. We have them as a couple, right? We have them as friends. Those are real discussions. Guys, no. Things have come against us. This cannot be God. We have to turn back. Well, no. Maybe God wants to show us something. Maybe God wants to do something. Blessed is the man, Psalm 84 says, who sets his heart on pilgrimage. Though he walk through the valley of Baca, which is the valley of tears, the valley of weeping, the valley of struggle, Right? God makes a pool. Those tears we cry become a pool. And on the road that we've walked, people come behind and they get refreshed by the tears that we've shed, by the pool that we've created. Because we've gone through the experience. We've gone through the storm. And now others can see that God was with us and saw us in the midst of a storm and be refreshed from what we've gone through. Because what we go through isn't just for ourselves. It's for those that come behind. Second thing is you're never out of God's reach. You're never out of God's sight and you're never out of God's reach. Is his arm too short to save? No. <laughs> Thanks, Deb. <laughs> Tom was contemplating whether he's going to heckle me or do the amens, you know. <laughs> we were having a discussion before church. <laughs> so about 3 o'clock in the morning, between 3 and 6, Jesus comes walking on the water out in the boat. Now, I wonder why Peter, in telling this story, didn't talk about him getting out of the boat when he's telling the story, but Matthew did in Matthew chapter 14 about Peter getting out of the boat. Just, just a thought, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So Jesus is coming out on the water, and they think it's, he's a ghost, right? They think, oh my goodness, what is this? It's a spirit, it's an aberration, right? They were superstitious in those days. They really were. There was a lot of superstitions, a lot of stuff that people believed, right? And it's, they didn't know it was Jesus. So he comes toward them, walking on the water. And just so you know that... that um, uh, yeah, it's an amazing story in that we know that in the history of the world, only two people walked on water, Jesus and Peter, for a short time, right? And, uh, and Job says in 9.8, he says, God alone has spread out the heavens and marches on the waves of the sea. Hmm. So what is Jesus demonstrating here? He's demonstrating God is in the flesh. That's what he's demonstrating. For God is the one who walks on the waves of the sea. But the next thing, Mark, is very important. He intended to go past them. Sounds like an odd statement to throw in there, right? He intended to go past them, right? So that sounds like Jesus is walking and just going to leave them in panic and struggle, right? That's what, the, that's what it sounds like, right? But it means one thing 
in English. He intended to go past them. But in the Greek, it carries a special force, and it's charged with some significance. It signals a rare and powerful revelation of God. Think of Mount Sinai. God takes Moses, puts him in the cleft of the rock, and he says, I'm going to pass by you. So that you you can't look upon my face, Moses. You can only look at my back. God's revealing himself. Or we think about in 1 Kings 19 where Elijah is in the cave. And he says, God passes by him. This is all about God revealing himself to them. They don't quite know who he is. They want to make him this human king. And he's saying, no, guys. Actually, what you want to do is beneath me. It's beneath my call. I'm God. He's revealing who he is in this moment. He's revealing he is God. He's revealing himself as the I am. Because what does he say? Here I am. Here I am. It's so interesting that they thought he was a ghost. They'd already been afraid of the storm and then seeing a figure walking on the water. What was going through their minds? But God's never far away. We're never out of his reach. Third thing, you're never out of God's care. Never out of his sight, never out of his reach, and never out of his care. He's always caring for us. Jesus said said to them, don't be afraid. Take courage, I'm here. Right? Don't be afraid. And the command, take courage, is the Greek word tharsio. It means to be brave or to be of good cheer. It is used by Jesus to call his people to depend on him as the source of their confidence. I don't know about you, but I'm a pretty confident guy. I have been a pretty confident guy my whole life. I've been in sports, and I excelled at some things, and I've always been pretty confident. But when you're out there and you're I was preaching the gospel once in the city square in the middle middle of Ukraine and when people start gnashing their teeth and spitting on you and telling you that you're stealing their children you tend to lose confidence in yourself or when you pray for someone and they're instantly healed And you think you can do it, and the next person you pray for, God doesn't even touch. Because you think it's your glory and not his. You tend to lose confidence. So when Jesus says, don't be afraid, take courage, he's saying, guys, I'm here. Now, take confidence in me. I'm with you. I'll take care of you. You're not out of my sight, you're not out of my reach, you're not out of my care. I'm with you. And then they arrive at their destination. And they're totally amazed.
they still didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves, according to Mark. Their hearts were too hard to take it in. Imagine that, walking with Jesus for those years, seeing miracle after miracle, hearing him speak, hearing him declare, hearing all of that, their hearts were still too hard to take it in. What chance do we have? I don't know about you, but I need God to give me a heart of flesh and take away the hard parts of my heart. Because the storms, the circumstances can do one of two things. They can harden our hearts and put us in a place of unbelief or they can be used as an opportunity to grow and to understand more of who God is. Every circumstance, every difficult moment is an opportunity for us to fall on our knees and to see God in a new and a fresh and greater way. He's all-knowing, he's all-present, he's all-powerful. And he cares for you. And he cares for me. And he sees you, and he sees me. And he reaches you, and he reaches me. In the deepest, darkest moments. In Psalm 139, David said, where can I go? If I ascend to the heavens, you are there. If I descend to hell, you are there to the depths. If I'm on the ocean, you are there. He is there. He is with us. We just moved into Ukraine. We were starting our work. And I was invited to speak at this youth event. It was these churches gathering, and there's lots of youth. And so I said, sure, I'll do it. So I speak at this big youth event in Ukraine. And I didn't know any Ukrainian. It's all translated at the time. It was very early on in, in our ministry there. And so I speak at this youth event, and the Holy Spirit comes. <clears throat> I mean in power. I'm speaking on fear. And I just say, God wants to set you free. Lift up your hands and receive freedom. And the spirit just came in. <sighs> Kids were just being set free, weeping and falling. And it was, it was amazing. And I thought, wow, this is incredible. These youth, these 120 youth or so, are just getting set free by the Holy Spirit. And, and, and I thought, this is amazing. Go home. And Deb was at, wasn't at the meeting. I, uh, we, we, I talked to her about it, that sort of thing. I get a call the next morning from the leaders of the two churches. They wanted to have a meeting with me. I said, okay, let me call a translator. No need, we have a translator for you. I said, okay. You know, I thought they were going to pat me on the back. That was amazing, you know, <laughs> sort of thing. <clears throat> I get there, and it's a semicircle, and there's two seats here, one for me, one for the translator. And they just started to rip into me, tear into me and say, what you did was not of God. I go, what? wait a minute here. I didn't do anything. <laughs> that if, if you want to get upset, get upset with the Spirit of God, not with me. I go, no, that was you. You put something in our kids' heads. That's exactly what they said to me. You put something in our kids' heads. And I go, well, hopefully it's the Word of God and that God is bigger than the boxes that we put him in. 
That did, they didn't like that too much. <clears throat> but if you've ever been through into a, a meeting with the council of the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees, that was the meeting. <laughs> I look back on it now 28 years later. And uh, God was teaching me something. After this amazing thing, he, was, he taught me two things. One is that I have this power in a broken vessel. That it comes from him for his glory, not for me. And the second thing is I cared about what men thought more than I cared about what God thought. When we get to that place where we have these amazing victories and it's all about me wanting to get the pat on the back, the encouragement for the praise of men, then we miss it. I missed it. And God had to take me on a journey to feel abandoned at times. The storm started to come against me. Deb will tell you, I was walking through a dark place in the midst of ministry, in the midst of the Holy Spirit moving. My personal walk with Jesus was like a for the first time in my life, I didn't hear his voice regularly. But now, 28 years later, I look back. The leader of that meeting is now leading YOM Ukraine. Others in that meeting are leading ministries all over the world. Churches have been planted. Nothing I did, it was for the glory of God. God gives us the reason why we walk through the storms. And that when we can look back at that, we can see Wow, God, look what you did. Because he watches us. He reaches us and he cares for us, even in the midst of the storm. Let's pray. Father, thank you for who you are in our lives. Thank you that uh, um, even in the times of victory, God, we can miss you. And we know that you use all things in our lives to teach us, to process through with us, to take us on a journey so that we could become more like your son. We know that you use the storms to sanctify us, to make us holy, to be like you. And so, Father, would you help us to understand that you are watching us, that your eyes never leave us, God, that you're watching over us at all times. Reveal that to us, I pray, even in the darkest moments. And Lord, would we experience you reaching us, God, as we did at salvation where you took us out of a miry pit and you placed us on a rock and you started a journey of destiny in our lives at that moment. You can reach us at any moment, Lord. And I pray for those that are going through difficult times right now. Would you reach them, God? And in your wisdom, would you 
reach them to a point, God, where you, your will would be known clearly to each one. Whether the timing is to pull them out or just to encourage them in the midst, I pray you would reach them. And Lord, reveal your love for us in a deeper way. Reveal, Lord God, that uh, all that we have, all that we are, comes from you. And Lord Jesus, I pray in Jesus' name that you would walk each one of us through this life from glory to glory because of who you are and what you desire in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.